God, but uh, Kelrim Stream Checklist um, uh, 1. Intro goes on for way too long because I forget to change out of my work clothes into something comfortable. Uh, check mark 2. I say alright or okay or hey. That is the start of every stream. Ba, 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 ba. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still, still getting used to like coming back to streaming and stuff. It, it feels a little bit funky. Uh, but yeah, I uh, had a uh, crappy, crappy week. Like, super crappy week. <laughs> like, everything bad that like could have happened, happened. So, uh, I was, like, feeling real shit, and I was like, uh, I'm cancelling the, the Tuesday, wait, when did it happen? It happened on Wednesday. I'm like, I'm ca cancelling the Wednesday stream, and I'm cancelling the Thursday stream, and I'm cancelling the Friday stream, and you know what, I'm just gonna log off Twitter, because when I was having the real shit, like, week, I logged into Twitter, which you should never do, never log into Twitter in general, but especially never log into Twitter when, um, when you're having a bad day, because I, I saw a bunch of terrible shit. Um, one terrible thing about a person I know, I'm not sure if it's true or not, and I was just like, eh. But uh, yeah, I'm talking like super quietly, because like 80% of my, my housemates are asleep. And it is, um, it is 11.45pm at night. Which is very, very, very late. And um, I'm trying not to wake them up. Well, we're, we're gonna be doing uh, a reading of the, Ho uh, the Hobbit. I'm trying to find like a nice, calm soundtrack by Adrian von Ziegler to play, so it's sort of just silenced while I'm reading. What's this like? Can I turn this down a bunch? If, if I play this, this is too loud. Yep, that's significantly too loud. I... What about this? Is this too loud? That's ah, probably fine. Let me, let me listen to it on the playback. Let me, uh, let me, let me listen to myself. That's <laughs> probably fine. Let me, let me listen to it on the playback. Ah, yeah, sounds fine. Eh, yeah, it's good enough. But uh, anyway, we're reading The Hobbit, which is a very special book to me because um. My great grandmother's, my grandma's mom, used to read this to me. Oh, cool! A, a, a scam bot. Let me just. How do I ban this person? Regan, ban this person. Oh, Regan's not here. Regan's asleep. I have to ban this person myself. How do I? How do I ban this guy? Get out of here! You're banned. I'm talking about I'm talking about my grandma. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, but uh, my grandma, who's my my mother's mother, bought me a copy of The Hobbit um, to celebrate me finishing year six and transitioning from um, primary school into secondary school. Um, so she bought me this really nice copy of The Hobbit. It's um, Essential Modern Classics and it's my favorite cover of the book. It has um has a Bilbo uh, and Smaug on it, and uh, I really like it because it's got like a bunch of extra shit in here which I really like. Um, it's really cool. Um, I've had this book for like how long has it been? Like ten years. This book is ten years old. I think. No, I've had it for ten years at least. But uh, without further ado, I suppose we shall get started. <clears throat> the Hobbit, or There and Back Again, by J.R.R. Tolkien. <clears throat> I'm very nervous. This is a story of long ago. At that time, the languages and letters were quite different from ours of today. English is used to represent the languages, but two points may be noted. One, the English-only correct plural of dwarf is dwarves. I'm reading this, by the way, this is super important. 
and the adjective is dwarvish. In this story, dwarves and dwarvish are used, but only when speaking of the ancient people to whom Thorin Oakenshield and his companions belonged. 2. Orc is not an English word. It occurs in one or two places, but is usually translated goblin or hobgoblin for the large kind. Orc is the hobbit's form of the name given at that time to these creatures, and is not connected at all with our orc, orc, applied to sea animals or dolphin kind. Runes were old letters originally used for cutting or scratching on wood, stone, or metal, and so were thin and angular. At the time of this tale, only the dwarves made regular use of them, especially for private or secret records. Their runes are in this book, represented by English runes, which are known to, to, now to few people. So, like, I know some people are like, I don't care, start the story. But, like, I like reading these little appendixes. They're very important. They're important. Shut up. Which are known to few people. If the rune on Thorin's map are compared with the transcriptions into modern letters on page 34 and 72, the alphabet adapted to modern English can be discovered and the above runic titles also read on the map. All the normal runes are found. And then the rest is in um, Dwarvish, so I have not le yet learned Dwarvish, but I will one day. <clears throat> Chapter 1. Do I want to get sued by Peter Jackson and play the official... Oh, no. I'm not going to play the official music. <laughs> Chapter 1. An Unexpected Part. In a hole, in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down or, or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. It had a perfectly round door, like a porthole, painted green with a shiny yellow brass knob in the exact middle. The door opened onto a tube-shaped hall, like a tunnel, a very comfortable tunnel, without smoke, with paned walls and floored tiles, and carpeted, provided with polished chairs and lots and lots of pegs for hats and coats. The hobbit was fond of visitors. The tunnel wound on and on, going fairly, but not quite, straight into the side of the hill. The hill, as all the people from miles round called it, and many little round doors opened out of it, first on one side and then on another. No going upstairs for the hobbit. Bedrooms, bathrooms, cellar, pantries, lots of these. Wardrobes, he had whole rooms devoted to clothes. Kitchens, dining rooms, all were on the same floor, and indeed, on the same passage. The best rooms were all on the left-hand side, going in, for these were the only ones to have windows, deep set round windows looking over his garden and meadows, beyond sloping down to the river. The hobbit was a very well-to-do hobbit, and his name was Baggins. The Bagginses have lived in the neighbourhood of the hill for time out of mind, and people considered them very respectable, not only because most of them were rich, but also because they never had any adventures or did anything unexpected. You could tell what a Baggins would say on any question without the bother of asking him. This is a story of how a Baggins had an adventure, and found himself doing and saying things altogether unexpected. He may have lost the neighbour's respects, but he gained, well, you will see whether he gained anything at the end. The mother of our particular hobbit. What is a hobbit? I suppose hobbits need some descriptions nowadays since they have become rare and shy of the big people, as they call us. They are, or were, a little people, about half our height, and smaller than the bearded dwarves. Hobbits have no beards, there is little or no magic about them, except the ordinary everyday sort which helps them to disappear quietly and quickly when large stupid folk like you and me come blundering along making a noise like elephants, which they can hear a mile off. They are inclined to be fat in the stomach. They dress in bright colours, chiefly green and yellow. Wear no shoes because their feet grow natural leathery soles and thick warm brown hair like stuff on their heads, which is curly. Have long clever brown fingers, good natured faces and laugh deep fruity laughs, especially after dinner, which they have twice a day when they can get it. 
sorry to, to interrupt, but that's an interesting thing, because the book mentions, like, uh, Elevensies, and I'm pretty sure, like, Fellowship in the book mentions Second Breakfast, but, like, a lot of the stuff that they adapted into the Hobbit uh, movie, which I liked the first one, second one was okay, third one, other shit, completely unnecessary. Um, I'm pretty sure the Hobbit movie, they, like, go through a list of them, and, like, half of them don't even exist in, like, Tolkien's work. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, oh, I, f I fucking love this book. I cannot stress enough. Like, having having an, an old Irish woman read you the Hobbit, like my Nana, it was such an experience. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll stop with the rub thing. I'm sorry. Don't get mad at me. Don't don't leave nasty comments being like, I can't stop the reading to talk about bullshit. It's important, trust me. <clears throat> now you know enough to go on with this. As I was saying, the mother of this hobbit, Bilbo Baggins, that is, was the famous Belladonna Took, one of the three remarkable daughters of the old Took, head of the hobbits who lived across the water. A small river that ran at the foot of the hill. It was often said, in other families, that long ago, one of the Took's ancestors must have taken a fairy wife. That was, of course, absurd, but certainly there was still something not entirely hobbit-like about them. And once in a while, members of the Took clan would go and have adventures. They discreetly disappeared, and the family hushed it up, but the fact remained that the Tooks were not as respectable as the Bagginses, though they were undoubtedly richer. Not that Baladonna Took ever had any adventures after she became Miss Bungo Baggins. Bungo, that was Bilbo's father, built the most luxurious hobbit hole for her, and partly with her money. That was to be found either under the hill or over the hill, all across the water, and there they remained, to the end of their days. Still, it was probable that Bilbo, her only son, although he looked and behaved exactly like a second edition of his solid and uncomfortable father, got something a bit queer in his makeup from the top side. Something that only waited for a chance to come out. The chance never arrived, until Bilbo was grown up, being about 50 years or so and living in the beautiful hobbit hole built by his father, which I have just described for you, until he had, in fact, apparently set it down immovably. Something I never quite grasp, and still don't quite grasp, is Bilbo's age, like, in human years, relative? Because, like, alright, he's 50 years old, 50 or 55, my brain is turned off. No, he's 50 years, around 50 years, um, in Hobbit years, which is still, like, real years, but, like, is that, like, 30s? Alright, I'm using the movie as a reference, because in this book, it sounds like he's, like, an old man, but he's not an old man, because he's an old man in Lord of the Rings, where he's 111. And here he's meant to be like, oh, he's settled down. Is he like 30? Because in the movie he looks real young. I I I'm gonna like say he's about 30. I'm gonna keep, in I'm gonna keep interrupting because I fucking love this book. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, I'm very giddy. I very much like this. By some curious chance, one morning, long ago, in the quiet of the world, when there was less noise and more green, and the hobbits were still numerous and prosperous, and Bilbo Baggins was standing at his door, after breakfast, smoking an enormous long wooden pipe that reached nearly down to his wooden toes, neatly brushed. Gandalf came by. Gandalf! If you had heard only a quarter of what I have heard about him, and I have only heard very little of all there is to hear, you will be prepared for any sort of remarkable tale. Tales and adventures spouted up all over the place, wherever he went, in the most extraordinary fashion. He had not been down that way under the hill for ages and ages, 
Not since his friend the old token died, in fact. And the hobbits had almost forgotten what he looked like. He had been away over the hill and across the water, on business of his own, since they were all small hobbit boys and hobbit girls. All that the unsuspecting builders saw that morning was an old man with a staff. He had a tall pointed blue hat, a long grey cloak, a silver scarf over which his long white beard hung down below his waist, and immense black boots. <coughs> the figure out with mentioned Bilbo. <coughs> Good morning, said Bilbo, and he meant it. The sun was shining, and the grass was very green. But Gandalf looked at him from under long, bushy eyebrows that stuck out further than the brim of his shady hat. <coughs> what do you mean? he said. Do you wish me a good morning? Or mean that it is a good morning whether I want it or not? Or that you feel good this morning? Or that it is a morning to be good on? All of them at once, said Bobo. And a very fine morning for a pipe of tobacco out of doors into the bargain. If you have a pipe about you, sit down and have a fill of mine. There's no hurry, we have all the day before us. Then Bilbo sat down on a seat by his door, crossed his legs and blew out a beautiful grey ring of smoke that sailed up into the air without breaking and floating away over the hill. Very pretty, said Gandalf, but I have no time to blow smoke rings this morning. I am looking for someone to share in an adventure that I am arranging, and it's very difficult to find anyone. I should think so, in these parts. We are plain quiet folk, and I have no use for adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things. <laughs> Make you late for dinner. I can't think where anybody sees in them, said our Mr. Baggins, and stuck one thumb behind his braces and blew out another, even bigger smoke ring. Then he took out his morning leathers and began to read, pretending to take no more notice of the old man. He had decided that he was not quite his sort and wanted him to go away. But the old man did not move. He stood, leaning on his stick and gazing at the hobbit without saying anything, till Bilbo got quiet, uncomfortable and even a little cross. Good morning, he said at last. We don't want any adventures here, thank you. We might try over the hill or cross the water. By this, he meant the conversation was at an end. What a lot of things you do use good morning for said Gandalf. Now you mean to that you want to get rid of me, and that it won't be a good till I move off. <laughs> not at all, not at all, dear sir. Let me see. I, I don't think I know your name. Yes, yes, my dear sir, and I do know your name, Mr. Bilbo Baggins, and you do know my name, though you don't remember that I belong to it. I am Gandalf, and Gandalf uh, means me. To think that I should have lived to be good morning by Belladonna Took's son, as if I was selling buttons at the door. Gandalf. Gandalf, good gracious me! Not the wandering wizard that gave or took a pair of magic diamond studs that fastened themselves and never un until ordered. Not the fellow who should tell such wonderful tales at parties about dragons and goblins and giants, the rescues of princesses and the unexpected luck of widow's sons. Not the man that used to make such particularly excellent fireworks. I remember those. Old Took used to have them on Midsummer's Eve. Splendid. They used to grow up like great lilies and snapdragons and lubbin arms of fire and hang in the twilight all evening. You were known as already that Mr. Baggins was not quite so prosy as you liked to believe. Also that he was very fond of flowers. Dear me, he went on, not the gander who was responsible for so many quiet lads and lasses going off into the blue for mad adventures, anything from climbing trees to visiting elves or sailing in ships, sailing to other shores. Bless me, life used to be quite into... I mean, you used to upset things badly in those parts once upon a time. I beg your pardon, but I had no idea you were still in business. Hi, welcome, we're reading my favourite book ever made. Where else should I be? said the wizard. All the same, I am pleased to find you remember something about me. You seem to remember my fireworks kindly at any rate, and that is not without hope. Indeed, for your old grandfather took sake, and for the sake of poor Balladonna, I will give you what you asked for. I beg your pardon, I haven't asked for anything. Yes, you have. Twice now. My pardon, I give it to you. In fact, I will go so far as to send you to this adventure. 
very amusing for me, very good for you, and profitable, too. Very likely, if you ever get over it. Sorry, I don't want any adventures, thank you. Not today. Good morning. But please come to tea any time you like. Oh, why not tomorrow? Come tomorrow. Goodbye. With that, the hobbit turned and scuttled inside his round green door and shut it as quickly as he dared. Not to seem rude. Wizards are wizards, after all. What on earth did I ask him to tea for? He said to himself as he went to the pantry. He had only just had breakfast, but he thought a cake or two and a drink of something would do him good after his fright. Gandalf, in the meantime, was still standing outside the door and laughing long but quietly. After a while, he stepped up and with the spike of his staff, scratched a queer sign of the hobbit's beautiful green front door. Then he strode away, just about the time when Bilbo was finishing his second cake, and beginning to think that he had escaped adventures very well. The next day, he had almost forgotten about Gandalf. He did not remember things very well unless he put them down on his engagement table like this. Gandalf, tea, Wednesday. Yesterday, he had been too flustered to do anything of the kind. Bilbo ADHD confirmed. Just before tea time, there came a tremendous ring on the front doorbell, and then he remembered. God, I gotta get my accents ready for all the dwarves. He rushed and put on the kettle, and put out another cup and saucer, and an extra cake or two, and ran to the door. I'm so sorry to keep you waiting, he was going to say. When he saw, it was not Gandalf at all. It was a dwarf with a blue beard tucked into a golden belt and very bright eyes under his dark green hood. As soon as the door was open, he pushed inside just as if he had been expected. He hung his hooded cloak on the nearest peg and, the while and at your service, he said with a low bow. Bilbo Baggins at yours, said the hobbit, too surprised to ask any questions for the moment. When the silence that followed had become uncomfortable, he added, I am just about to take tea. Pray, come and have some with me. A little stiff, perhaps, but he meant it kindly. And what would you do if an uninvited dwarf came and hung his things up in your hall without a word of explanation? They had not been at table long, in fact. They had hardly reached the third cake when there came another even louder ring at the door. Excuse me, said the hobbit, and off he went to the door. So you got here at last? That was what he was going to say to Gandalf this time. But it was not Gandalf. Instead, there was a very old-looking dwarf on the step, with a white beard and a scarlet hood, and he too hopped inside as soon as the door was open, just as if he had been invited. I see they've begun to arrive already, he said when he caught sight of Dwylan's green hood hanging up. He hung his red one next to it, and a barlin after your service, he said with his hand on his breast. Thank you said Bilbo with a gasp. It was not the correct thing to say, but they had bega I have began to arrive had flustered him badly. He liked visitors, but he liked to know them before they arrived, and he preferred to ask them himself. He had a horrible thought that the cakes might run short, and that he, as the host, he knew his duty and stuck to it, however painful he might have to go without. Come along in and have some tea, he managed to say after taking a deep breath. A little beer would suit me better if it's all the same to you, my good sir, said Ball with the white beard. But I don't mind some cake, seed cake if you have any. Lots, Bilbo found himself answering to his surprise, and he found himself scuttling off too, to the cellar to find a pint beer mug, and then to pantry to fetch two beautiful round seed cakes, which he had baked that afternoon for his after-supper morsel. When he got back, Barlin and Dwalin were talking at the table like old friends. As a matter of fact, they were brothers. Both were plumped down the beer and the cake in front of them, when a loud ring came the bell again, and then another ring. Gandalf for certain this time, he thought as he puffed along the passage, but it was not. It was two more dwarves, both with blue hoods, silver belts, and yellow beards, and each of them carrying a bag of tools and a spade in. They hoped as soon as the door began to open. Bilbo was hardly surprised at all. 
What can I do for you, my dwarves? He said. Killy, at your service, said the one. And Philly, added the other. And they both swept off their blue hoods and bowed. Killy and Philly got fucked over in the movie. They got... They tried to expand their characters. But they're like forced in love interests. Which made me so fucking mad. Like they brought in... I forgot her name. Oh, I'm such a terrible Lord of the Rings fan. I forgot her name, but they forced in what's her face from The Hobbit. And then they also forced in um, Legolas, which was such a horrible decision. It was like, hey guys, remember Legolas? Dude, you have Gimli's grandfather in the book. That's good enough. You have Gimli's grandfather, and you have Bilbo, and you have Gandalf. That is enough Lord of the Rings references in your movie. I'm fucking pissed that they ruined the Hobbit for that. <sighs> they both swept off their blue hoods and bowed. At yours and your families. Oh, wrong person. At yours and your families, replied Bilbo, remembering his madness' time. Dwell on Balan here already, I see, said Killy. Let us join the throng. Throng, thought Mr. Baggins. I don't like the sound of that. I really must sit down for a moment and collect my wits and have a drink. He had only just one sip in the corner when the four dwarves sat round the table and talked about mines and golds and troubles of the goblins and the depredations of dragons and lots of other things which he did not understand and did not want to, for they sounded much like adventures. When ding dong a ling ling his bell rang again, as some naughty little hobbit boy was trying to pull the handle off. Someone's at the door, he said, blinking. Some foes, I should say, by the sound, said Philly. Besides, we saw them coming around along behind us in the distance. The poor little hobbit sat down in the hall and put his head in his hands and wondered what had happened and what was going to happen and whether they would all stay for supper. Then the bell rang again louder than ever and he had to run to the door. It was not four. After all, it was five. Another dwarf had come along while he was wandering in the hall. He had hardly turned the knob before they were all inside bowing and saying, At your service! One after another. Dory, Nori, Ori, Oin, and Gloin. I only remember Gloin. <laughs> were their names, and very soon, two purple hoods, a grey hood, a brown hood, and a white hood were hanging on the pegs, and off they marched, with their broad hands stuck in their gold and silver belts to join the others. Already, it had almost become a throng. Some called for ale, and some for porter, and one for coffee, and all for them them for cakes, so the hobbit was kept very busy for a while. This scene in the first movie was adapted perfectly, and the stuff that they added just made it more fun. Hence why I like the first movie, because it's just like, it's just like almost word for word the book. A big jug of coffee had just been set in the hearth, the sea cakes were gone, and the dwarves were sitting on a round of buttered scones. When there came a loud knock, not a ring, but a hard rat-tat, on the hobbit's beautiful green door, somebody was banging with a stick. Bilbo rushed along the passage, very angry and altogether bewildered and bewilders. This was the most awkward Wednesday he had ever remembered. He pulled open the door with a jerk, and they all fell in, one on top of the other. More dwarves, four more, and there was Gandalf behind, leaning on his staff and laughing. He made quite a dent on the beautiful door. He had also, by the way, knocked out the secret mark that he had put there the morning before. Carefully, carefully, he said. It's not like you, Bilbo, to keep friends waiting on the mat, and then open the door like a pop gun. Let me introduce Beefer, Bofer, Bomba, and especially Thorin. At your service, said Beefer, Bofer, and Bomba, standing in a row. Then they hung up two yellow hoods and a pale green one, and also a sky blue one with a long silver tassel. This last belonged to Thorin, an enormously important dwarf, in fact. 
no other than the great Thorin Oakenshield himself, who was not at all pleased at falling flat on Bilbo's mat, with Beefer, Botha, and Bombo on top of him. For one thing, Bombo was immensely fat and heavy. Thorin indeed was very haughty, and said nothing about service. But poor Mr. Beckin said he was sorry so many times, till at last he grunted. Pray don't mention it, and stopped frowning. Now we are all here, said Gandalf, looking at the row of thirteen hoods, the best detachable party hoods, and his own hat hanging on the peg. Quite a merry gathering. I hope there is something left for the latecomers to eat and drink. What's that? Tea? No, thank you. A little red wine for me. And for me, said Thorin. And the raspberry jam and apple tart, said Beefer. And mince pies and cheese, said Bofa. And pork pie and salad, said Bumbo. And more cakes and coffee and an ale, if you don't mind, called the other dwarves around the door. Put on a few eggs, there's a good fellow, Gandalf called after him as the hobbit stumped off to the pantries, and just bring out the cold chicken and pickles. Seems to know as much about the inside of my larder as I do myself, thought Mr. Baggins, who was feeling positively flunked, and was beginning to wonder whether a most wretched adventure had not come right into his house. By the time he had got all the bottles and dishes and knives and forks and glasses and plates and spoons and things piled up on big trays, he was getting very hot and red in the face and annoyed. Confiscate and be bother these dwarves, he said aloud. Why don't they come and lend a hand? Lo and behold, there stood Balin and Dwalin at the door of the kitchen and Philly and Killy behind them. And before he could say knife, they had whisked the trays and a couple of small tables into the parlour and set out everything fresh. Gandalf sat at the head of the pantry. Party, not pantry, holy shit. At the head of the party, with the thirteen dwarves all round, and Bilbo sat on a stool at the fireside, nibbling at a biscuit. His appetite was quite taken away, and trying to look as if this was all perfectly ordinary and not in the least an adventure. The dwarves ate and ate and talked and talked and time got on. At last they pushed their chairs back and Bulba made a move to collect the plates and glasses. I suppose you will all stay to supper, he said in his politest, unpressing tones. Of course, said Thorin, and after. We shan't go through the business till late, and we must have some music first. Now to clear up, Thereupon the twelve stools, not Thorin, he was too important, and stayed talking to Gandalf, jumped to their feet, and made tall piles of all the things. Off they went, not waiting for trees, balancing columns of plates, each with a bottle on the top, with one hand while the hobbit ran after them, almost squeaking with fright, Please be careful, and please don't trouble, I can manage. But the dwarves only started to sing. <clears throat> Chip the glasses and crack the plates, blunt the knives and bend the forks. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates. Smash the bottles and burn the corks. Cut the cloth and turn up the fat. Pour the milk on the pantry floor. Leave the bones on the bedroom mat. Splash the wine on every door. Dump the corks in a burning bowl. Pound them up with a thumping bowl. And when you finish, if any, a hole. Send them down the hall to roll. That's what big old Baggins hates. So carefully, carefully with the plates. And of course, they did none of these dreadful things. And everything was cleaned and put away safe as quick as light. While the hobbit was turning round and round in the middle of the kitchen, trying to see what they were doing, they went back and forth and found Thorin with his feet on the fender, smoking a pipe. He was blowing the most enormous smoke rings, and wherever he told one to go, it went up the chimney, or behind the cloak on the mantelpiece, or under the table, or round and round the ceiling. But wherever it went, it was not quick enough to escape Gandalf. He sent a smaller smoke ring from a short clay pipe straight through each of Thorin's. 
Then Gandalf's smoke ring would go green and come back to hover over the wisp's head. He had a cloud of them about him already, and in the dim light, it made him look strange and sorcerous. Bilbo stood and watched. He loved smoke rings, and then he blushed to think how proud he had been yesterday morning of the smoke rings he had sent up the wind over the hill. Now for some music. What, what's the wrong voice for Thorin? Now for some music, said Thorin. Bring out the instruments. Killia and Philly rushed for their bags and brought back little fil fiddles. Dory, Nori, and Ori brought out flutes from somewhere inside their coats. Bomba produced a drum from the hall. Bifa and Bofa went out too and came back with clarinets that they had left amongst the walking sticks. Dwalin and Bubbin said, Excuse me, I left mine at the porch. I just bring mine in with you, said Thorin. They came back with violas as big as themselves, and with Thorin's harp wrapped in a green cloak. It was a beautiful golden harp, and when Thorin struck it, the music began all at once. It was a beautiful golden harp, and Thorin struck it, the music began all at once, so sudden and sweet that Bilbo forgot everything else and was swept away into dark lands under strange moons far over the water and very far from his hobbit hole under the hill. The dark came into the room from the little window that opened in the side of the hill. The firelight flickered. It was April, and still they played on, while the shadow of Gandalf's beard wagged against the wall. The dark filled all the room, and the fire died down, and the shadows were lost. And still, they played on, and suddenly, first one and then another began to sing as they played, deep-throated singing of the dwarves in the deep places of their ancient homes. And this is like a fragment of their song, if it can be like their song without their music. Far over the misty mountains cold through dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away ere break of day to seek the pale enchanted gold. The dwarves of yore made mighty spells, while hammers fell like ringing bells in places deep. Where dark things sleep, in hollowed halls beneath the fells, for ancient kings and elvish lords, there many a gleaming golden horde. They shaped them wrought, and light they caught, to hiding gems on hilts of sword, on silver necklaces. They strung the flowering stars on crowns they hung, the dragon fire in twisted wire. They meshed the light of moon and sun far over the misty mountains cold, through dungeons deep and caverns old. We must away. A break of day to claim our long forgotten gold. Goblets they carved there for themselves, and hearts of gold where no man dwells. There lay they long, and many a song was sung unheard by men or else. The pines were roaring on the height, the winds were moaning in the night, the fire was red, it flaming spread, the trees like torches blazed with light, the bells were ringing in the dale, 
and men looked up with faces pale. Then dragon's eye, uh, more fierce than fire, lay low their towers and houses frail. The mountain smoked beneath the moon. The dwarves they heard the tramp of doom. They fled their hall to dying fall. Beneath his feet, beneath the moon, far over the misty mountains grim, to dungeons deep and caverns dim, we must away a break of day to win our harps and gold from him. As they sang, the hobbit felt the love of beautiful things made by hands, and by churning, and by magic moving through him. A fierce and jealous love, the desire of the hearts of dwarves. Then something tookish woke up inside him, and he wished to go and see the great mountains, and hear the pine trees and the waterfalls, and explore the caves, and wear a sword instead of a walking stick. He looked out of the window. The stars were out in the dark sky above the trees. He thought of the dwarf. He thought of the jewels of the dwarves, shining in dark caverns. Suddenly, in the wood beyond the water, a flame leapt up. Probably somebody lighting a wood fire. He thought of plundering dragons settling on his quiet hill, and kindling it all to flames. He shuddered. And very quickly, he was plain Mr. Baggins of Baggins to Underhill again. He got up trembling. He had less than half a mind to fetch the lamp, and more than half a mind to pretend to go and hide behind the beer barrels in the cellar, and not come out again until all the dwarves had gone away. Suddenly, he found the music, and the singing had stopped, and they were all looking at him, with eyes shining in the dark. Where are you going? said Thorin, in a tone that seemed to show that he had guessed both half of the dwarf's mind. The hobbit's mind. Fucking hell. My my brain. Uh, what about a little light? said Bilbo apologetically. We like the dark, said all the dwarves. Dark for dark business. There are many hours before dawn. Of course, said Bilbo and sat down in a hurry. He missed the stool, and sat in the fender, knocking over the poker and shovel with a crash. Hush, said Gandalf, let Thorin speak. And this is how Thorin began. Gandalf, dwarves, and Mr. Baggins, we are met together in the house of our friend and fellow conspirator. This most excellent and audacious hobbit May the hair on his toes never fall out. All praise to his wine and ale. He paused for breath, and for a polite remark from the hobbit. While the compliments were quite lost on poor Bilbo Baggins, who was wagging his mouth in protest at being called audacious, and, worst of all, fellow conspirator. Though no noise came out, he was so flummoxed, so Thorin went on. We are met to discuss our plans. Our ways means policy and devices. We shall soon, before the break of day, start on our long journey. A journey from which some of us, or perhaps all of us, except our friend and consular, the ingenious wizard Gandalf, may never return. It is a solemn moment. Our object is, as I take it, well known to us all. To the instrumental Mr. Baggins, and perhaps to one or two of the younger dwarves, I think I should be right in naming Killy and Philly, for instance. The exact situation at the moment may require a little brief explanation. This was Thorin's staff. He was an important dwarf. If he had been allowed, he would probably have gone on like this until he was out of breath, without telling anyone there anything. That was not known already. 
but he was rudely interrupted. Poor Bilbo couldn't bear it any longer. At May never return, he began to feel a shriek coming up inside, and very soon it burst out like a whistle of an engine coming out of a tunnel. All the dwarves sprang up, knocking over the table. Gandalf struck a blue light on the end of his magic staff, and in its firework glare the poor hobbit could be seen, kneeling on the half rug, shaking like a jelly that was melting. Then he fell flat on the floor, and kept calling out, Struck by lightning, struck by lightning, over and over again. And that was all they could get out of him for a long time. So they took him and laid him out of the way on the drawing room sofa with a drink at his elbow, and they went back to their dark business. Excitable little fellow, said Gandalf, as they sat down again. Gets funny queer fits, but he is one of the best, one of the best, as fierce as a dragon in a pinch. If you have ever seen a dragon in a pinch, you will realise that this was only poetically exaggeration, applied to any hobbit. Even to old Took's great-great-uncle, Bull Roller, who was so huge for a hobbit that he could ride a horse. He charged the ranks of goblins of Mount Graham in the Battle of the Greenfields and knocked their king, Golfenball's head clean off of a wooden club. It sailed a hundred yards through the air and went down a rabbit hole, and in this way the battle was won, and the game of golf invented at the same moment. That is my favourite line of the entire book. I fucking love that fact. And in the movie, in the fucking movie, they're like, oh, you made that up. Fucking makes me angry. In the meanwhile, however, Bull Rower's gentler descendant was reviving in the drawing room. After a while, in a drink, he crept nervously to the door off the parlor. This is what he heard glowing speaking. <laughs> or some snort, more or less like that. We do the ethic. It's all very well for Gandalf to talk about the hobbit being fierce, but one shriek like that in a moment of excitement would be enough to wake the dragon and all his relatives and kill a lot of us. I think it sounded more like fright than excitement. In fact, if it had not been for the sign on the door, I should have been sure we had come to the wrong house. As soon as I clap my eyes on the little fellow bobbing and puffing on the mat, I have my doubts. It looks more like a grosser than a burglar. Then Mr. Baggins turned the handle and went in. Took's side had won. He suddenly felt he would go without bed and breakfast to be thought fierce. As for little fellow bobbing on the mat, it made him really fierce. Many a time afterwards, the Baggins part regretted what he did now. But he said to himself, Bilbo, you were a fool. You walked right in and put your foot in. Pardon me, he said. If I have overheard words that you were saying, I don't pretend to understand what you were talking about, or your reference to burglars, but I think I am right in believing, this is what he called being on his dignity, that you think I am no good. I will show you. I have no signs on my door. It was painted a week ago, and I am quite sure you have come to the wrong house. As soon as I saw your funny faces on the doorstep, I had my doubts, but treat it as the right one. Tell me what you want done, and I will try it if I have to walk from here to the east of east and fight the wild wereworms in the last desert. I had a great 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 uncle once, Bull Rubber took, and... Yes, yes, that was a long time ago, said Gloin. I was talking about you, and I assure you there is a mark on this door, and the usual one in the trade, or used to be. Burglar wants a good job, plenty of excitement, and reasonable reward. That's how it's usually read. You can say expert treasure hunter instead of burglar if you like. Some of them do. It's all the same to us. Gandalf took us. Gandalf told us that there was a man of the sort in these parts looking for a job at once, and that he had arranged for a meeting here this Wednesday tea time. Of course there is a mark, said Gandalf. I put it there myself, for very good reasons. You asked me to find the 14th man for your expedition, and I chose Mr. Baggins. Just let anyone say I chose the wrong man or the wrong house, and you can stop at 13 and have all the bad luck you like, or go back to digging coal. He scowled so angrily, angrily at Gloin that the dwarf huddled back to his chair. And when Bilbo tried to open his mouth to ask a question, he turned and frowned at him, and stuck out his bushy eyebrows. 
till Bilbo shut his face tight with a snap. That's right, said Gandalf. Let's have no more argument. I have chosen Mr. Baggins, and that ought to be enough for all of you. If I say he's a burglar, then I, I burglar he is. Or will be when the time comes. There is a lot more in him than you have guessed. A deal more than he has any idea of himself. You may all live to thank me yet. Now, Bilbo, my boy, fetch the lamp, and let's have a nice light on this. On the table, in the light of a big lamp, with a red shade, he spread a piece of parchment, rather like a map. This was made by Thora, your great-grandfather Thorin, he said in answer to the dwarf's excited questions. It is a plan of the mountain. I don't see that this will help us much, said Thorin, disappointedly after a glance. I remember the mountain well enough, and the lands about it. I don't know where Mirkwood is, and the withered heath, where the great dragons bred. There is a dragon mark in one. There is a dragon marked in red on the mountain," said Barman. "It will be easy enough to find him without that if we ever arrive there. There is one point that you haven't noticed," said the wizard, "and that is the secret entrance." You see the ruin on the west side, and the hand pointing towards it on the other room, on the other rooms. That marks a hidden passage to the lower halls. It may have been secret once, said Thorne, but how do we know that it is a secret any longer? Old Smaug has lived there long enough to find out anything there is to know about those caves. He may have. She can't have used it for years and years. Why? Because it is too small. Five feet high, the door, and three may walk abreast, say the room. But Smaug could not creep into a hole that size, not even when he was a young dragon. Certainly not after devouring so many of the dwarves and men of Dale. It seems a great big hole to me, squeaked Bilbo who had no experience of dragons, and only of hobbit holes. He was getting excited and interested again, so that he forgot to keep his mouth shut. He loved maps, and in his hall there hung a large one of the country round with all his favourite walks marked out in red ink. How could such a large door be kept secret from everybody outside, apart from the dragon? he asked. He was only a little hobbit, you must remember. In lots of ways, said Gandalf. But in what way this one has been hidden, we don't know without going to see. From what it says on the map, I should guess there is a closed door which has been made to look exactly like the side of the mountain. That is the usual dwarves' method. I think that is right, isn't it? Quite right, said Thorin. Also, went on, went on Gandalf, I forgot to mention that with the map, want a key. A small and curious key. Here it is. He said and handed to Thorin a key with a long barrel and intricate wards made of silver. Keep it safe. Indeed I will, said Thorin, and he fastened it upon a fine chain that hung about his neck and under his jacket. Now things began to look more hopeful. This news alters them much for the better. So far, we have had no clear idea of what to do. We thought of going east, as quiet and careful as we could, as far as the Long Lake, after the trouble would begin. A long time before that, if I know anything about the road east, interrupted Gandalf. We might go from there, up along the river running, went on Thorin, taking no notice. And so to the ruins of Dale, the old town in the valley there, under the shadow of the mountain. But we, none of us, like the idea of the front gate. The river runs right out of it through the great cliff at the south of the mountain. And off of it comes the dragon, too. Far too often, unless he has changed his habits. That would be no good, said the wizard. Not without a mighty warrior, even a hero. 
I tried to find one, but warriors are busy fighting one another in distant lands, and in this neighbourhood heroes are scarce, or simply not to be found. Swords in these parts are mostly blunt, and axes are used for trees, and shields as cradles or dish covers, and dragons are comfortably far off. That is why I settled on burglary, especially when I remembered the existence of a side door. And here is our little Bilbo Baggins, the burglar, and chosen and selected burglar. So now, let's go on and make some plans. Very well then, said Thorne. Supposing the burglar expert gives us some ideas or suggestions. He turned with mock politeness to Bilbo. Uh, but first, I should like to know a bit more about things, said he, feeling all confused and a bit shaky inside, but so far still tookishly determined to go on with things. I, I mean about the gold and the dragon and all that, and how it got there, and who it belongs to, and so on further. Bless me, said Thorin. Haven't you got a map? And didn't you hear our song? And haven't we been talking about all this for hours? Well, all the same, I should like it all plain and clear, said he, obstinately putting on his business manner. <coughs> usually reserved for people who tried to borrow money off of him, and doing his best to appear wise and prudent and professional, and live up to Gandalf's recommendation. Also, I should like to know about risks, uh, out-of-pocket expenses, time required, and remuneration, and so forth, by which he meant, what am I going to get of it, and am I going to come back alive? Oh, very well, said Thorin. Long ago, in my grandfather Thor's time, our family was driven out of the far north, and I came back with all their wealth and their tools to this mountain on the map. It had been discovered by my far ancestor, Tharain, the old. By now, they mined and they tunneled, and they had made huge halls and great workshops. And in addition, I believe, they found a good deal of gold and a great many jewels, too. Anyway, they grew immensely rich and famous, and my great-grandfather was king under the mountain again, and treated with great reverence by the mortal men who lived to the south, and were gradually spreading up the river run, as far as the valley overshadowed by the mountain. They built the merry town of Dale, there in those days. Kings used to send for our smiths and reward even the least skillful, mostly rich. Fathers would beg us to take their sons as apprentices, and pay us handsomely, especially in food supplies, which we never bothered to grow or find for ourselves. Altogether, they were good days for us, and the poorest of us had money to spend and to lend. The leisure is to make beautiful things just for the fun of it, not to speak of the most marvellous and magical toys, the like of which is not to be found in the world nowadays. So my grandfather's hills came full of armor, and, and jewels, and carvings, and cups, and the toy market of day was the wonder of the north. Undoubtedly, that was what, was bro what brought the dragon. Dragons steal golden jewels, and you know from men and elves, and dwarves, wherever they can find them, and they guard their plunder as long as they live is practically forever unless they are killed, and never enjoy a brass ring of it. Indeed, indeed they hardly know a good bit of work from a bad, though they usually have a good notion of the current market value. <laughs> yes, in, in Tolkien, in official Tolkien lore, dragons apparently know the market value of items just innately. I don't know why this is never brought up. Apparently, d dwarves know commerce. Not dwarves, um, dragons just naturally know commerce. So, like, if you got a dragon to work the stock market, that would be an excellent decision. According to official Tolkien law. This is official law. That's nuts. 
and they can't make a thing for themselves. Wait, wrong voice. For themselves. Not even men the loose scale of their armour. There were lots of dragons in the north in those days, and the gold was probably getting scarce up there, with the dwarves flying south or getting killed, and all the general waste and destruction that dragons make going from bad to worse. There was a most specially greedy, strong and wicked worm called Smaug. One day he flew up into the air and came south. The first we ever heard of it was a noise like a hurricane, coming from the north, and the pine trees on the mountain creaking and crackling in the wind. Some of the dwarves who happened to be outside, I was one luckily, a fine adventurous lad in those days, always wandering about, and I saved my life that day. Saw the dragon from a good way off. Then he came down the slopes, and when he reached the wood, they all went up in fire. By that time, all the bells were ringing in Dale, and the warriors were Armin. The dwarves rushed out of their great gate, but there was a dragon waiting for them. None escaped that way. The river rushed up in steam and fog and fell on Dale, and in the fog, the dragon came on them and destroyed most of the warriors. The usual unhappy story. It was only too common in those days. Then he went back and crept in through the front gate and routed out all the halls and lanes and tunnels, alleys, cellars, mansions and passages. After that, there were no dwarves left alive inside and he took all their wealth for himself. Probably for that is a dragon's way. He had piled it all up in the great heap far inside and sleeps on it for a bed. Later, he used to crawl out of the great gate and come by night to Dale and carry away people, especially maidens, to eat, until Dale was ruined, and all the people, dead or gone. What goes on there now, I don't know for certain. I don't suppose anyone lives nearer to the mountain than the far edge of the long lake nowadays. The few of us that were outside sat and wept in hiding and cursing Smaug. And there we were, unexpectedly joined by my father and grandfather with singed beards. They looked very grim, but they said very little. When I asked how they had got away, they told me to hold my tongue and said that one day, in the proper time, I should know. After that, we went away. We had had to earn our living as best we could, up and down the land often enough sinking as low as blacksmith work, or even coal mining. But we have never forgotten our stolen treasure. And even now, when I will allow, we have a good bit laid by, and are not so badly off. Here Thorin stroked the gold chain around his neck. We still mean to get it back, and to bring our curse home to Smalg, if we can. I have often wondered about my father's and grandfather's escape. I see now they must have had a private slide door, which only they knew about. But apparently they made a map, and I should like to know how Gandalf got hold of it, and why it did not come down to me at the rightful heir. I did not get a hold of it. I was given it, said the wizard. Your grandfather Thora was killed, you remember, in the mines of Moria by Asgog the Goblin. Curse his name, yes, said Thorin. And Thorin, your father, went away on the 21st of April, a hundred years ago, last Thursday, and has never been seen by you since... True, true, said Thorin. Well, your father gave me this to give you, and if I have chosen my own time and way of handling it over... You can hardly blame me, considering the trouble I had to find you. Your father could not remember his own name when he gave me the paper, and he never told me yours. So on the whole, I think I ought to be praised and thanked. Here it is, said he, handling Thorin the map. I don't understand, said Thorin, and Bilbo felt he would have liked to say the name. Say the same, Jesus. I'm, 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 I'm,
apparently can't read. The explanation did not seem to explain. Your grandfather, said the wizard slowly and grimly, gave the map to his son for safety before he went to the mines of Moria. Your father went away to try his luck with the map after your grandfather was killed. And lots of adventures of a most unpleasant sort he had. But he never got near the mountain. How he got there, I don't know. But I found him a prisoner in the dungeon of the Necromancer. Whatever were you doing there? said Thorin with a shudder, and all the dwarves shivered. Never you mind. I was finding things out, as usual, and a nasty, dangerous business it was. Even I, Gandalf, only just escaped. I tried to save your father, but it was too late. He was witless and wandering, and had forgotten almost everything, except the map and the key. We have long ago paid the goblins of Moria, said Thorin. We must give a thought to this necromancer. Don't be absurd. He is an enemy far beyond the powers of all the dwarves put together. If they could be collected again from the four corners of the world. The one thing your father wished was for his son to read the map and use the key. The dragon and the mountain are more than big enough task for you. Hear, hear, said Bilbo, and accidentally said it aloud. Hear what, they all said, suddenly turning towards him. And he was so flustered that he answered, uh, Hear what I have to say. What's that? they asked. Uh, well, I should say that you ought to go east and have a look around. After all, there is a side door, and Dragon must sleep sometimes, I suppose. And if you sit on the doorstep long enough, I dare say you will think of something. And, well, don't you think? I think we have talked long enough for one night, if you see what I mean. Uh, what about bed uh, and an early start and all that? I will give you a good breakfast before you go. Before we go, I suppose you mean, said Thorne. Aren't you the burglar? And isn't sitting on the doorstep your job? Not to speak of getting inside the door. But I agree about bed and breakfast. I like six eggs with my ham when starting on a journey. Fried, not poached. And mind, you don't break em. After all the others had ordered their breakfast, without so much as a please, which annoyed Bilbo very much, they all got up. Dorba had to find room for them all, and filled all his spare rooms, and made beds on chairs and sofas before he got them all stowed, and want, went to his own little bed, very tired, and not altogether unhappy. One thing he did make his mind up about was not to bother to get up very early and cook everybody else's wretched breakfast. The Turkishness was wearing off, and he was not now quite so sure that he was going on any journey in the morning. As he lay in bed, he could hear Thorin still humming to himself in the best bedroom next to him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Bilbo went to sleep with that in his ears, and it gave him very uncomfortable dreams. It was long after the break of day when he woke up. The end of chapter one. That was that was a fun little time. Um, I'll probably probably continue reading this if people want to hear more of it. Um, if you liked it, like let me know. Cause uh, chapter two was roast mutton, which is a pretty good chapter. I like roast mutton. Um, it's a nice chapter. There's a lot of goofy, silly things that happen. Uh, my favorite chapter is probably everyone's favorite chapter, Riddles in the Dark. Like, I think that's literally everyone's favorite chapter in this book, because you get introduced to Gollum, you get introduced to the Ring, um, you get to all the shit where Tolkien was just like, hey, 
maybe this like bedtime story for my son um, could become a whole series. And then <laughs> he went from writing a kid's book, because The Hobbit was it was meant to be a kid's book. Remember, it was like the, the 60s, the 50s. Fucking shit was different back then. Um, he went from The Hobbit, who was like, I'm going to write a fucking adult book. And then he made the greatest book it ever made. Even though I personally like The Hobbit more. I think there's something... I don't know, there's something really chill and, like, beautiful about The Hobbit. I, I think it's, like, it's a good coming-of-age story. Like, it's not a coming-of-age story, but it feels like it is, if that makes sense. It's just a fun little adventure, and I really fucking like it. Uh, fun fact about this book, um, I take The Hobbit with me whenever I, like, go on a big holiday like if I if I leave my state if I I leave the part of the world I am I bring this book to read I have read this book probably about 30 times possibly more I fucking love it but uh yeah chapter 2 will probably be next time but Right now, let's see who is streaming at the moment that we can raid. Because uh, it's nearly 1am and I'm a little tired. Oh my god, everyone I know is streaming. Uh, we're going to choose between people. Oh, I'm going to choose between people. What's Ray doing? Ray's doing a just chatting stream to her. What's Ray doing? What you doing? To play Minecraft. That's not just chatting, that's Minecraft. Um... Go for Cl uh, Clea, because Clea is real cool. I love her model. She's a real chill person. She actually did my um, she did my profile picture on Twitter. Um, she's real cool. So we'll rate her. But yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I really appreciate it. Next stream is tomorrow around 9 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. I am streaming Fire Emblem with Regum. And it'll it'll be a fun time. But apparently, according to Regan, we're, we're going to be halfway through Fire Emblem uh, genealogy of the Holy War. Um, because apparently, at the end of the next chapter, it's the genealogy starts. We get to have all the new characters, so that's um super cool and epic. So um uh, yeah, that's about it. I'll see ya. Bye 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 b